Thank you. Um, since this is my last lecture, I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for putting this together and also for making the effort to move this um, online. I, of course, wish we could have all been together in France, um, but it's nice that we were able to do it this way anyway. Um, and thank you all for coming to hear the third installment about uh, algebraic K theory and trace methods. So what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit more about topological Hoch shield homology. We talked a lot about topological cyclic homology on Tuesday, but now I want to dig in a little bit deeper about THH itself. Um, to get started, I want to recall some things that were said already earlier in the week, but that will be very important for us today. So I just want to make sure um, we're all on the same page with some of these basic constructions. So let's remember all the way back to Monday. And on Monday, we talked about how if you have a ring A and you want to study its algebraic K-theory, there's a map relating the algebraic K-theory of the ring and the Hochschild homology of the ring. And that map was called the Dennis trace. And that map was sort of the starting point for the whole trace method and algebraic K-theory approach. So um, this Hochschild homology is gonna be very important for us today. So I know that I've already defined it, but I wanna recall the definition just so it's fresh in our memory as we talk uh, a little bit more deeply about it. So what is Hochschild homology? Well, remember that we defined a simplicial abelian group, which we called the cyclic bar construction. So this is the cyclic bar construction. And we said on Monday that what this is, is that in the qth level, this is just Q plus one copies of my ring A tensored together. And it had some face and degeneracy maps. And I even want to recall those face maps because they'll come up again for us today. So what did the face maps do? Well, they take a tensor and most of those face maps just take the ith and ith plus first coordinate and multiply them together. So for the most part, these face maps just send this to AI times AI plus one, like so. Oh, I used a Q. And that makes sense as long as I is less than Q. But remember that last face map did something different. It brought the last element around to the front and then multiplied. So that last face map sends this to AQ A0, tensor A1 through AQ minus one. Okay, those were the face maps that we had on Monday. And then we said that the degeneracies insert the unit after the ith coordinate. So that was what our degeneracies did. And then we noted that we also had an additional operator, which is called a cyclic operator. That's not part of the simplicial structure, but it is important for us. And that cyclic operator was the operator that just takes my tensor and brings that last factor around to the front. Okay, so we defined this cyclic bar construction on Monday, and then I said, well, what is Hochschild homology? Well, Hochschild homology is just the homology of this cyclic bar construction. But what is the boundary map in that chain complex? Well, it's the alternating sum of these face maps. And you can check that that squares to zero. We can take homology, and that's called Hochschild homology. And we also said, well, by the dold kahn correspondence, I could alternatively define this as the homotopy groups of the geometric realization of this simplicial object. Okay, so that was Hochschild homology as we had it on Monday. And then we noted something important about it on Monday, which was that it's really not just a simplicial object, it's what we call a cyclic object. So this uh, cyclic bar construction is a cyclic object which means by the theory of cyclic sets that um, its geometric realization has an S1 action. Okay, so we talked about that on Monday. And then what did we say about this? Well, <clears throat> what we learned on Monday is that that is an approximation to algebraic K theory, but we can do better by thinking about a topological analog of this theory. So on Monday, we talked about how there is a topological analog. It's called topological Hochschild homology. And topological Hochschild homology is related to a K, to K theory via a trace map as well. And that actually factors the Dennis trace. So that first map, the map between K theory and THH is often referred to as the topological Dennis trace 
or sometimes just the dentist trace. And this second map is linearization. Okay, and what was the idea, the rough idea of how to define topological Hox shield homology? Well, we said on Monday the idea was supposed to be the following. The idea was that, well, in the definition of the cyclic bar constructions, I had rings, and now I'm going to replace those with ring spectra, the topological version of rings. My tensor products will become smash products. Instead of working over the integers, I'm really working over the sphere spectrum. And if you make those replacements, then you'd probably make the following definition of THH. You'd say for R, a ring spectrum, the topological Hochschild homology of R is the geometric realization of the cyclic bar construction on R. And then we said when we talk about topological Hochschild homology of rings for a ring A, THH of A is just notation for topological Hochschild homology of the eilenberg maclean spectrum of that ring, the, the ring spectrum associated to that ring. Okay, and then one more thing that we noted on Monday and talked uh, about at length on Tuesday is that this topological Hochschild homology is an S1 spectrum. Okay, and we saw that that was essential to our applications. That was essential to defining topological cyclic homology from it. Okay, so those were all things that we recalled on Monday, or I'm recalling things from Monday, excuse me. Um, but one thing to note about this, about the history of this, is that it was Bockstedt who first, oh, excuse me, it was Bockstedt who first constructed topological Hochschild homology. But Bockstedt did this many years ago, and he didn't have some of the nice luxuries that we have today. <laughs> so in particular, when Bockstedt made this construction, he didn't have nice categories of spectra with an associative smash product. So what I've written here is this idea, today we can execute that quite literally and define topological Hochschild homology as this cyclic bar construction. But at the time Bockstedt originally constructed THH, you couldn't do that so literally because those tools just didn't exist yet. So if you look back at Bockstedt's construction, what we now call the Bockstedt model of THH, you see that um, he developed a lot of machinery to work around that. He developed what we now refer to as the Bockstead smash. But the interesting thing um, is that for years, up until very recently, for K-theory applications, we continued to use Bockstead's model, even though it makes perfect sense now with the current technology to give this kind of cyclic bar construction definition. And why is that? Well, the reason is because it was known that Bockstedt's THH was cyclotomic, and it wasn't known how to put a cyclotomic structure on this definition. So can you put a cyclotomic structure on the cyclic bar construction? Now, in recent years, this story has changed a bit because of major advances in equivariant homotopy theory. And that's sort of the starting point for the new material I want to talk about today is um, is the cyclic bar construction model for THH and how now we can understand a cyclotomic structure on that. So this comes out of major advances in equivariant stable homotopy theory um, coming from work of Hill Hopkins and Ravenel on the Curvair invariant one problem. So in particular, in the context of their work on Curvair invariant one, they studied extensively what are called norms in equivariant homotopy theory. And so I wanna say a little bit about these norms. So as I said, um, the norms, as I'm going to talk about them today, are due to uh, coming out of work of Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel, building on earlier work. So there was earlier work on equivariant norms due to Greenlease and May. OK, so uh, let me say a little bit about these, equivariant, these norms in equivariant stable homotopy theory. So what's the idea? Well, let's say that we have G, a finite group and H, a subgroup of G. The norm functors that Hill, Hopkins, Ravenel study have the following form. So we have what are called norm functors. And the norm from H to G is a function, functor, excuse me, that goes from H spectra to G spectra. So it's a functor that takes as input in H spectrum and it gives you out a G equivariance 
uh, spectrum. These are symmetric monoidal functors is a very nice thing about them. And in the commutative case, they have a nice characterization. So in the commutative case, they're characterized as follows. So you can show that the norm from H to G, if you input a commutative uh, ring H spectrum, so a commutative uh, object in H spectra, that what you get out is you get a commutative G ring spectrum. Okay. And further, this norm functor in the commutative case is left adjoint to the restriction functor. I'll call it I H star. I've used the word restriction a lot of different ways uh, in this lecture series. So what is this functor? Well, the, the restriction functor here, what I mean is just the functor that, um, you know, we have this G spectrum and we forget down to an H spectrum. So we only remember the H action part of that. Okay, so these norms in equivariant stable homotopy theory, it turns out that by studying these deeply, Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel were able to get a handle on the curvier invariant one problem. But that's a very different question than the kinds of questions that we've been looking at. So how does this connect? Why does this connect to topological Hochschild homology or this trace method story? I mean, how would you even think, why would you, the first question I wanna address is why would you even think that there would be a connection there? So the first hint that there might be a connection there comes out of a theorem of Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel. And Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel prove the following. They prove that if R is cofibrant and G is finite, uh, there is an equivalence as follows. They construct a map from R to uh, what you get when you take the norm from the trivial group to G of R and then take the G geometric fixed points of that. Tin, we received a couple of questions to you. Uh, the first question is uh, about do these norms exist for general G or only for finite G? Uh, that's a great question. I feel like I almost planted that question. Um, <laughs> so Hill Hopkins and Ravenel constructed these norms for finite G, but we are in a minute going to talk about extending it to a non-finite group. So in some general sense, yes, they only exist for finite G. And if you want to talk about these norms for a particular group that's not finite, um, you need to somehow construct what that is, which we are going to do in just a moment. Um, and what do I mean when I say commutative? Yeah, I mean uh, like actual commutative monoids in uh, in the this categories of equivariant spectra so this is like a genuine notion of commutative in uh genuine uh equivariant homotopy theory um okay so what was i saying right so the hill hopkins and ravenel compute uh, constructed this kind of diagonal map and proved that this gives you an equivalence and if you look at that well it's, it looks a bit familiar, right? It looks like it could be related to that classical definition of cyclotomic spectra that we had on Tuesday. So if you remember what that definition was, cyclotomic spectra were supposed to be things where you take the geometric fixed points and you get back the original spectrum that you started with. Now that's not exactly what's happening here, right? We have additionally some norm functor in there, but it looks like there could be some kind of relationship. This is giving me some kind of diagonal map involving um, geometric fixed points. So this feels reminiscent of cyclotomic structures. Okay, so uh, I think that question was anonymous, but somebody just pointed out that I've said that these norm functors exist for finite groups. Um, and so you could ask, well, can we do this for a group that's non, not finite? So in work of Bieglek Engeltweit, uh, Andrew Blumberg, myself, Mike Hill, Tyler Lawson and Mike Mandel. Sorry, that's a lot of people. Um, and let me also mention that there's related work around the same time due to Martin Stoltz. Um, we extended the norm to consider norms to S1. So we, uh, we show that you can extend this. You can extend norms to consider a function, functor, functor, sorry, <laughs> the norm from the trivial group to S1. Now, this makes sense if what you start with is an associative ring spectrum. And this is going to spit out an S1 spectrum. 
So what is this norm functor that we construct? Well, the claim is that the norm from uh, the trivial group to S1 should be viewed as the functor that takes a ring spectrum and sends it to, to the geometric realization of its cyclic bar construction. Okay, so what is the content of saying that that's a norm functor? Well, the claim is that that behaves like a norm. So in particular, if you restrict to the commutative case, you're gonna see this thing as the left adjoint of the forgetful functor from S1 spectra down to um, associative ring spectra. I see there's a question. I mean, strictly associative here. I really do mean associative ring spectra. Um, so, okay, so we show that you can, um, you can define a norm in that way. Or another way of saying that is, well, that's like saying we could view topological Hochschild homology. Really, we should think of this as an equivariant norm. It's the norm from the trivial group to S1. And then what is the theorem here? Well, the theorem of uh, these same people, Engelbite, Blumberg, Gerhardt, Hill, Lawson, Mandel, is that we show that if R is cofibrant, sorry, for R cofibrant, that this definition of topological Hochschild homology as the norm which is the cyclic bar construction definition, actually does have a cyclotomic structure. So for many years, this was a question, can you put a cyclotomic structure on the cyclic bar construction? And it turns out that using um, this work of Hill, Hopkins, Ravenel and these uh, norm functors, you can indeed do so. So in other words, there's a cyclotomic structure on the cyclic bar construction after all. Um, I see a question in the chat about can we define the S1 norm on bare spectra with no ring structure? No, the S1 norm in order to be a sensible construction does need to input an associative ring spectrum. So that is a bit different than what happens in the classical case where the norm from H to G for finite groups inputs an H spectrum, not necessarily an H ring spectrum. Yeah, good question. Um, Okay, so, and then let me mention that there's a subsequent theorem of Dotto, Malkovich, um, Pachkoria, Sagave, and Wu. <laughs> um, and what do they show? Well, so I've just said that the cyclic bar construction definition of THH has a cyclotomic structure you'd wanna know that it's the same or equivalent to the cyclotomic structure that on the Bogshed model, right? That we're getting the same theory of topological cyclic homology out of these. And that's what Dado, Malkovich, Patch, Corius, Sagave, and Wu show. So they show that the cyclotomic structure that we construct on the cyclic bar construction agrees with or is equivalent to, um, to the one on Bogshed's model the one that we've used historically uh, for K-theory applications. Now that's further nice because, you know, we talked on Tuesday about how Nikolaus and Schulze um, also have this new framework for studying K-theory. And I didn't say much about their model of THH, but they construct THH in an infinity categorical setting as a cyclic bar construction type construction. Um, and Nikolaus Schultz to compare their cyclotomic structure also to Bakshed's. So Dado, Malkovich, Pachkoria, Sagave, and Wu's results tell you that all three um, versions of THH have equivalent cyclotomic structures. So that's nice. Okay, so I'm claiming now that we could think of topological Hochschild homology as an equivariant norm. And why is that the nice way to think about it? Well, one reason that that's a nice way to think about it is that it lends itself to some nice generalizations. So I wanna mention one of those generalizations now, which is coming out of this uh, same work. So we make the following generalization. Let's say we want to study an equivariant ring spectrum. So a CN ring spectrum. Now we can define a CN twisted version of topological Hochschild homology. So I'm gonna write this like this, topological Hochschild homology, the CN topological Hochschild homology of R. And then, well, what should this be? Well, recall that I just said that ordinary topological Hochschild homology is supposed to be a norm from the trivial group to S1. 
Now I'm feeding my THH something that already has a cyclic group action. So what is the topological Hochschild homology of that going to be? Well, I claim that it's the norm from CN to S1 of R. Now, the next natural question is, but what, is, what does that even mean, right? I've told you how to define the norm from the trivial group to S1, but what is the norm from the cyclic group CN to S1? So how can we construct this? Well, in the commutative case, you could set, you could define it as a left adjoint to a restriction functor. But if you want to take input that's not necessarily commutative, you need to give a more concrete construction. So how do we construct this norm? Well, I claim that you can do this using a cyclic bar construction, but not a classical cyclic bar construction. We're going to have to use a variant of the cyclic bar construction. So I want to use a variant of the cyclic bar construction. And I'm going to write this variant in the following way. I'm going to write it as B sick CN. This is going to be a CN twisted version of the cyclic bar construction. So here's how we define this twisted cyclic bar construction. So at first, it's going to seem similar to what we did before. So on the qth level, this thing is going to be q plus 1 copies of r. r is a spectrum, so they're smashed together. And it has the usual degeneracies. So the usual degeneracies, by which I mean they just insert a unit in the correct spot after the ith coordinate. But the face maps are a bit different. So in order to define the face maps for you, I need to first introduce a piece of notation. So I'm going to let G denote the generator um, e to the 2 pi i, 2 pi i over n of Cn. And then I'm going to let alpha q be a map on the qth level, so from my q plus 1 copies of r to itself. And this operator alpha q, it does two things. The first is that it cyclically permutes the last factor to the front. And the second is that it acts on the new first factor by this element little g. So I should have mentioned uh, maybe up here that when I take this cyclic bar construction that my input r is now a cn ring spectrum. OK. So let me draw, uh, maybe let me make a little schematic here. So I have my Q plus one copies of R. And what does this alpha Q do? Well, it takes the last one. It wraps it around to the front. Now it's the new first factor, and it acts on it by this generator little g, which makes sense because R is an equivariant spectrum. OK, that was supposed to be by way of telling you what the face maps are. So what are the face maps? Well, they're defined as follows. A lot of them are just the same old thing that they were before. The ith face map, most of them are just multiplication of the ith and i plus first factors, as long as i is less than q. But what is the last one? Well, the last one is something different now. So the last one I'm going to define to be, let's do this operator alpha q bring that last factor around the front, act on it by little g, and now I'm going to multiply the first two factors together, which is also the map d0. OK, so that's my new um, last based map. So my first note is that I claim that this is still a simplicial object, meaning that you know we have these simplicial identities that we need to check. And you can check that the simplicial identities are still satisfied. So this is, is simplicial. But while you're checking identities, you might check for those cyclic identities. Is it a cyclic object? And you'll learn quickly that this is simplicial, but not cyclic. And that initially seems like bad news. Because if you remember, it was the fact that the cyclic bar construction was cyclic that when we geometrically realized, we got an S1 action. Now, I'm claiming that this thing is supposed to have an S1 action because I'm wanting it to be the norm to S1. So how do I understand why it would still have an S1 action? Well, it's not cyclic. You can check. It doesn't satisfy, the pro satisfy those identities. But it does have additional structure. So let's see what kinds of things are true. 
Well, this operator alpha Q, it generates a CN Q plus one action in simplicial degree Q. Why is that? Well, alpha Q is both rotating the Q plus one factors and acting by a generator of CN. So that's gonna generate a CN times Q plus one action in simplicial degree two, Q. And further, the face and degeneracy maps uh, satisfy some properties. So we already said by definition, if I do alpha Q followed by D zero, that was my definition of DQ. But you can check that if you do alpha Q followed by DI for some other DI, where I is between one and Q, that what you get is DI minus one alpha Q minus one. And similarly, uh, the alpha satisfies some properties, some relations with respect to the degeneracies, which I won't write down. So if you write down all of those relations, what you'll see is that it turns out that this is an example of a familiar object. So this defines what is called a lambda n op object in the sense of Bokstad, Shang, and Madsen. So interestingly, this structure came up in Bokstad, Chang, and Madsen's work on topological cyclic homology in a different way. It came up because they were studying edgewise subdivisions, and, uh, and this kind of structure naturally arises in that context as well. So if n equals 1, a lambda n op object is just a cyclic object. So this is a generalization of what it means to be cyclic. And the nice thing about the fact that Bokstad, Chang, and Madsen have already studied this kind of object in depth is that uh, we can steal some stuff that we know from them. <laughs> so in particular, Bokstad, Chang, and Madsen prove that when you geometrically realize this kind of object, uh, sorry, that geometric realization of this kind of object still has an S1 action. Okay, which is good news for us because we were hoping to have um, such an S1 action. Okay, so then what is the definition of this twisted uh, topological Hochschild homology? Well, the definition is as follows. That the CN twisted topological Hochschild homology of my CN spectrum R, well, I said it's supposed to be the norm from CN to S1 of R, and I claim that that norm can be constructed as this twisted cyclic bar construction on R. Tina, uh, there is a question to you. Uh, can you say something about the universal property satisfied by the modified cyclic bar construction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should be able to answer that, and it's just it's not in my brain right now. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the this kind of like uh, lambda n op object, the place to look for like a lot of understanding of that object is um, the Baksha Chang Madsen paper where they originally defined the cyclotomic trace. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't have right. I'm sorry, I just can't I can't uh, get there right now with the, with the universal property characterization. Um. So. Okay, so I claim that this twisted cyclic bar construction is a construction of this, this norm from CN to S1. And in particular, we show that when you restrict to the commutative case, that this, this twisted cyclic bar construction is the left adjoint to the forgetful functor in the way that you would want. So it has the, the properties that uh, characterize uh, a norm in the commutative case. Uh, I should also note in the interest of honesty that uh, in this definition that I've written down here, I'm omitting some what we call change of universe functors to sort of make the um, technical equivariant stable homotopy theory correct. Uh, and so if you are an expert in that area and are looking for those, uh, they're there, I just didn't write them. <laughs> and if you don't know about change of universe functors, I would just, for these purposes, ignore it. Okay, so this is CN twisted topological Hochschild homology. And then a question that you might immediately come to about this is, well, THH was cyclotomic and that was important to the story. So is this twisted THH still cyclotomic? So we proved the following, 
that uh, for our cofibrant, um, and if P is prime to N, then the CN twisted topological Hoch shield homology of R is P cyclotomic. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I defined P cyclotomic when we talked about cyclotomic spectra on Tuesday, but P cyclotomic just means that you only check those cyclotomic conditions at the prime P. So it's like specific at the prime P. Um, and therefore we can define uh, CN twisted versions of topological cyclic homology as well. So that's nice. The next question I, I might ask uh, about this theory uh, at first is, well, can you actually compute this twisted cyclic, uh, twisted topological Hoch shield homology of anything? So is CN twisted topological Hoch shield homology computable? And what might you want even want to try to compute? So maybe it's nice to have an example in mind of like what kind of thing would it be interesting to try to understand? Well, for instance, um, we could ask, can we understand the C2 twisted THH of the spectrum MUR? So what is MUR? Well, MUR is the C2 equivariant real bordism spectrum. This was defined by uh, Landweber and Fuji, but it's gotten a lot of attention in recent years because it played a really fundamental role in the solution to the Curvair invariant one problem. So this is um, this is uh, a particular C2 equivariant spectrum that there's a lot of interest in. I see that there's a question in the Q&A, which is, is there a description of the CN relative THH in terms of a factorization homology type construction? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for those who are familiar, ordinary topological Hochschild homology can be described in terms of the factorization homology of David Ayala and John Francis. Um, the, this CN twisted THH is, uh, has been described by Asaf Horov in terms of his theory of equivariant factorization homology. So yes, he gives a characterization of these, this uh, relative THH in terms of an equivariant version of factorization homology. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the kind of example that we, uh, we might want to understand. Now, if you think about this, <laughs> you'll realize that, you know, we talked a lot on Tuesday about how to compute topological cyclic homology, but I was always sort of assuming in that discussion that we understood THH to begin with. Like we described an inductive proper process to build off of THH to understand its fixed points. Or in the Nikolaus Schulze model, we understood THH, but then we would study its homotopy fixed points or its uh, Tate construction. I didn't talk at all about how to actually compute THH. So I've said very little about that. So before I can talk about this question, is this twisted THH computable? We need to take a step back and talk about, well, how do you compute ordinary THH? So let's say something about that. How do we compute ordinary THH? Ordinary topological Hoch shield homology is really, you know, the starting point for sort of modern trace methods. If you can't compute THH of the object you're interested in, you're not going to be able to compute topological cyclic homology or algebraic K-theory. It all starts with THH. So one of the main tools for computing to ordinary topological Hoch shield homology is called the Bockstead spectral sequence. And what is the Bockstead spectral sequence? Well, it works in the following way. Topological Hochschild homology, remember, was a realization of a cyclic object, which I've been writing as the cyclic bar construction. Now, when you have a cyclic object like that and you study its realization, you get a spectral sequence induced by the skeletal filtration. So that's a standard tool. The skeletal filtration induces a spectral sequence that's going to converge to the homology of the spectrum THH with coefficients in some field. Now, what is the E2 term of that spectral sequence? Well, what Bokshed proved, which is really, I mean, just really nice, is that when you look at the spectral sequence that you get from the skeletal, fil skeletal filtration, on E2, you get something familiar. You get ordinary Hochschild homology. So the E2 term here is the Hochschild homology of the homology of R. 
So this is, I think, so beautiful that if you want to study this topological theory of topological Hochschild homology, we get this spectral sequence whose E2 term is living in the algebraic analog, which is easier to compute. I mean, Hochschild homology has uh, all the tools of homological algebra at your disposal. So it's something that's much more computable than this topological theory. So Bakshtab constructed this spectral sequence and did some beautiful calculations with it right off the bat. So Bakshtab computed the topological Hochschild homology of FP and also the topological Hochschild homology of the integers. And these, I mean, Bakshtab did this work quite a few years ago now, but these calculations, particularly the topological Hochschild homology of FP, are still foundational to so much work we do in K-theory today. So many of those calculational results that I mentioned on um, Monday take as input Bakshtad's work on THH. Okay, so the Bakshtad spectral sequence is very powerful and has been foundational to calculations. And so one question is, well, what does this mean in our setting? So I'd want to have an equivariant version of this, of this Bakshtad spectral sequence for twisted THH. That was probably the easiest way or one direct way to get a handle on, um, on calculations here. Okay, so I think about that and I think, well, what, what does that mean to want that? Well, my Bokshtad spectral sequence should compute the topological theory. It should compute some homology of twisted THH and the E2 term should be the algebraic analog of twisted THH. And then we realize, we have no idea what that is, right? What is the algebraic analog? So what is the algebraic analog of twisted THH? Well, it's not immediately obvious what that should be, right? Um, in a classical theory, we started from the algebra and we made a topological construction analogous to it. Now we've generalized that. And it's not clear anymore what algebra that comes from. So maybe we should revisit what it meant to be the algebraic analog in the classical case, and that will hopefully provide us some inspiration. So what did it mean in the classical case? Well, in the classical case, we were looking at rings, and we had a relationship between topological Hochschild homology and ordinary Hochschild homology. That was the linearization map. And we remember that this is notation for THH of the eilenberg maclean spectrum. Now, I haven't mentioned so far, but in the classical theory, not only do you have this linearization map relating this to these two, but it's also the case that in degree zero, it's an isomorphism. So this linearization map in degree zero is an isomorphism. So I'd like some analogous story with my twisted THH. I'd like to understand how it relates to some algebraic analog, but if we look at this classical story, you know, I took Hochschild homology of a ring and it was related to THH of the eilenberg maclean spectrum. And so that brings me to a question, which is, well, now I need my input for my twisted theory needs to be equivariant. And so the question is, how do I get a CN ring spectrum as an eilenberg maclean spectrum? I'm going to need to do that in order to make sense of this analog. Or a different way maybe of phrasing that question is, what is the equivariant analog of a ring? OK, so I need to get at those questions if I'm going to be able to um, understand this, uh, this kind of uh, equivariant analog. Okay, so we're gonna take a little detour to talk about some basic objects in equivariant homotopy theory that we haven't actually heard much about yet this week, and they're called Mackie functors. So this is gonna seem like a, you know, a detour for a second, and I'm gonna, it's gonna bring us back to this question of what is the equivariant analog of a ring. Now, if you've never seen a Mackie functor before, the thing that you should have in your head about Mackie functors is that Mackie functors are like the abelian groups of equivariant stable homotopy theory. So what do I mean by that? Well, in ordinary homotopy theory, we have a lot of invariants that give us abelian groups. In equivariant homotopy theory, we have a lot of invariants that give us Mackie functors. 
So what is a MAC functor? Well, I'm going to let my group be finite. So for G finite, a MAC functor M is actually a pair of functors. So I'm going to call one of them M lower star and one of them M upper star. And they're functors from finite G sets to abelian groups. One of them is covariant and one of them is contravariant. Okay, so I have these two functors and uh, the, 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 um, they have to satisfy a few properties. So one is that I, the functors have to agree on objects. So M lower star of X has to agree with M upper star of X and that shared value is called M under bar of X. So when you see these under bars, that's indicating that we're working with Mackey functors. Tina, I need, uh, yes. Uh, sorry to have interrupted you. There is a question. Uh, what goes wrong if you try to copy the definition of C and twist it, THH, for G equivariant uh, Z module spectra? Um, right. So I think that the question is that in the ordinary case of topological Hochschild homology, um, you can define topological Hochschild homology like re a relative version of Hochschild, topological Hochschild homology for module spectra. And if you do relative TH, that I'm using the okay. If you do relative THH for HZ modules in the classical case, you get back the algebraic theory of Hochschild homology. And so I think the question here is, um, why can't I do this twisted version for HZ module spectra, and would that give me back what I want? Um, you know, I have to admit that I have not thought about uh, the relative, like the a relative version of the twisted theory. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I don't have a good answer off the top of my head of what kinds of considerations you would need to take there. Um, I just haven't thought through uh, thought through how that that we haven't defined that object, and I haven't thought through how that definition uh, would work. And another question uh, from Sean Tilson. So yeah, so Sean says you get some Shukla stuff because of the tensor product being derived. Um, yeah, so. Well, I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm going to talk about this equivariant theory of Hochschild homology, and that can be generalized to this this uh, version of Shukla homology as well. Um, it's not defined in the way that was just mentioned as like thinking of this as equivariant twisted things over HZ module spectra, um, and I have not thought about whether that's equivalent. Um, okay, so right, I was saying what a Mackey functor is. So a Mackey functor is a pair of functors that have to agree on values. They need to take disjoint union to direct sum, and they have to satisfy some axioms that I'm not going to write today. So um, if you haven't seen Mackey functors before, uh, one nice sort of diagrammatic thing to keep in mind about Mackey functors is the following. So in particular, if you have some nested subgroups of your group G, so I have K sitting inside H sitting inside G, we have a projection map, right, from G mod K to G mod H. So what happens with the Mackey functor? Well, the Mackey functor, these G mod K and G mod H, those are finite G sets. So I get a value for the Mackey functor at G mod H. I get a value for the Mackey functor at G mod K. And I have a covariant functor and a contravariant functor relating them. So I get maps in both directions. Um, the covariant functor we usually call the transfer from k to h and the contravariant functor is often referred to as the restriction from k to h um, and it turns out any finite g set is a direct sum of these orbits these things of the form g mod k and so characterizing what happens on these orbits really tells you what happens with the whole Mackey functor now We've actually seen a Mackey functor already, even though we didn't put it in that terminology, we've been working with a Mackey functor sort of all week, um, which is the following. If you have X, a G spectrum, you get a G Mackey functor, which is the homotopy Mackey functor of X. So 
I want to specify for you what is this homotopy Mach functor do on, on an orbit g mod h. And this is supposed to give me some abelian group. And what does it give me? Well, it gives me the nth homotopy group of the h fixed points of my spectrum x. So uh, on Tuesday, all that time, we were studying fixed points of THH. In particular, we were studying a Mackey functor. And when I say Mackey functors are like the abelian groups of equivariant homotopy theory, this is kind of what I have in mind. In ordinary homotopy theory, my homotopy groups are going to spit out abelian groups. And in equivariant homotopy theory, the homotopy, the, the natural way to think about homotopy of an equivariant spectrum is as a Mackey functor. So Mackey functor constructions are very closely tied to equivariant spectra. So let me note that if you have a G Mackey functor, let's call it M, it has an eilenberg maclean spectrum attached to it, which is a G spectrum. And we write that as HM. And in what sense is it eilenberg maclean Well, it's a G spectrum, so I can take its homotopy Mackey functor. And what do I get out? In degree zero, I get my Mackey functor back. And in all other degrees, I get zero. So that's the sense in which this is eilenberg maclean OK, so that's nice. To a Mackey functor, I can associate an eilenberg maclean equivariant spectrum. And we're also going to need a notion of norms for these Mackey functors. So Hill and Mike Hill and Mike Hopkins um, give a definition of what it means to take a norm of a Mackey functor. And they say the following, if H is a subgroup of my finite group G and M is an H Mackey functor, they wanted to define what it means to take the norm from H to G of the Mackey functor M. And here's their definition. Their definition is, OK, so I have my Mackey functor, and I just said I could um, take an eilenberg maclean spectrum associated to it. Now, that's an H spectrum. I have a norm in equivariant spectra, the hill hopkins ravenel norm. So I can take the norm from H to G in spectra. Now I have a G spectrum, but I wanted a G Mackey functor. And so to get back to Mackey functors, I can take Mackey functor pi 0 of that. So the plus minus on this definition of Mackey functor norms is the following. Um, on the upside, it's nice to define. It really highlights the close relationship between Mackey functors and the equivariant theory of G spectra. And if you want to prove theorems about the Mackey functor norm, this is often the definition that you use. The minus of this definition is if you want to actually compute the norm of a specific Mackey functor, uh, this is very difficult to get, get a handle on a computation this way. So there are much more algebraic constructions of the norm in Mackey functors that are due, for instance, to Kristen Mazur and Rolf Hoyer. Um, and they have more a hands-on approach of understanding this without going through the equivariant um, stable homotopy theory. OK, but the Hill-Hopkins definition is, is clean and, uh, and can be useful for us. So, one other thing we need to note about this is that there's a symmetric monoidal product on this category of G Mackey functors, which is given by what's called box product. So what is the box product of two G Mackey functors? Well, this box product, one way of saying what it is, is it's closely related to the product in symmetric, uh, in equivariant spectra. I can take my eilenberg maclean spectrum of M, my eilenberg maclean spectrum of N, smash them together to get a G spectrum, and then take Mackey functor pi zero to get a G Mackey functor. Tina, uh, there is a question. Are the contravariant maps on PIN some sort of averaging over H uh, mod, mod K? Yeah, OK. So um, I've been maybe a little sloppy is the wrong word, neglectful up here. So uh, when I talked about this homotopy Mackey functor, I just told you what it does on each on these orbits. Uh, a homotopy Mackey functor is more than just, of course, the information of what happens to the finite G sets. It's also these contravariant functors, these um, transfer and restriction maps. In the context of uh, the homotopy Mackey functor, how do we think about that? Well, one of them, um, the restriction map, 
is uh, a nice, easy to describe map. That's a map given by inclusion of fixed points. So it's actually confusingly the map that we called F earlier in the week, not the map we called R. Um, there's a clash of notation there, but, but that map is inclusion of fixed points. The other map is um, in this context, sometimes called the, well, maybe not in this exact context, but it's what's called the equivariant transfer map. Um, and the way to think about that map maybe is that it comes from um, what's called the Wirth-Muller isomorphism and equivariant homotopy theory tells you that you have these kinds of maps as well, but it's sort of a unique thing to being in the equivariant setting. So you use the Wirth-Muller isomorphism and also some duality of these orbits to um, talk about that transfer map. Um, yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, this box product, I've given you a definition of the box product, and then this is similar to what I was saying about the norms, which is that this is a definition that goes through equivariant stable homotopy theory. Mackey functors are really algebraic objects. You're supposed to think of them as living in algebra, and lots of people in math use Mackey functors that are not interested in stable homotopy theory. Um, Mackey functors are useful for studying representation rings and other things. Um, so you can define the box product totally algebraically, uh, but I'm giving you this characterization to show the relationship with the G spectra. Okay, so now I have this symmetric monoidal product on G Mackey functors, and finally I'm ready to address the question of what is an equivariant ring. Well, an equivariant abelian group is a Mackey functor. An equivariant ring is called a green functor. So a green functor is a monoid in this category. And then the note is that if I have a green functor, for a green functor R, its eilenberg maclean spectrum is a, well, let's say, for a green functor R for CN, its eilenberg maclean spectrum is a CN ring spectrum. So one of our questions was, well, how do we get an equivariant ring spectrum um, as an eilenberg maclean spectrum? And the answer is using green functors. So what do I really want for that equivariant analog? Well, it turns out that what I need is a theory of Hochschild homology for green functors. Okay, and that theory of Hochschild homology for green functors um, is defined using that same kind of construction of a twisted cyclic bar construction. So we could do the same construction that we did for spectra. Now we can do it in the context of these green functors. So where we had a ring spectrum before, I replace it with my green functor. Where I had smash products, I replace it with box products. But if you do that same twisted construction and it makes sense here. And so what is the definition then of uh, Hochschild homology for green functors? Well, this comes out of work of Andrew Blumberg, myself, Mike Hill, and Tyler Lawson. And the definition is the following. If you have H inside G inside S1, and R, an H green functor, we look at the G twisted Hochschild homology of R. And we prove that it's the homology of a twisted cyclic bar construction on the norm from H to G of R, the Mackey functor norm. Um, for R. And okay, so, oh yeah, so is the box product symmetric? Yeah, this is the symmetric monoidal structure in this category. Um, G symmetric monoidal structures, uh, in order to talk about that, you really wanna be working more with Tambara functors and not just with Mackey functors. And I think I'm kind of, I don't wanna go there right now. <laughs> um, but yes, it is a symmetric monoidal structure. And it, if you're working with Tambara structures, it, Tambara functors, you get um, even more than that. Um, okay, so I claim that this is the equivariant, or sorry, the algebraic analog of my twisted THH. And the theorem is that, well, we have a linearization map relating these theories. So if I look at the H twisted THH of my eilenberg maclean spectrum and I take its homotopy Mackey functor, that maps to this uh, twisted version of topological Hochschild homology for green functors. And this is further an isomorphism if k is equal to zero, which is what we wanted to see from the um, 
which is what we wanted to see from the perspective of what happens in the classical case. So our goal, part of our goal was to define an equivariant version of the Bokshted spectral sequence. So another like point of proof that this is the right algebraic analog would be if you had a Bokshted spectral sequence computing twisted THH with E2 term in this Hochschild homology for green functors. And indeed there is such a spectral sequence. So in work of Catherine Adamic, um, myself, Catherine Hess, In Bark Lang, and Hannah Giacong, we show that we construct such an equivariant spectral Bokshed spectral sequence. So we construct an equivariant Bokshed spectral sequence for twisted THH, and it has E2 term in the Hochschild homology for green functors. So that's saying that this Hochschild homology for green functors really is you know, the right algebraic analog that you're looking for. Um, and it turns out that this spectral sequence can be used computationally. So part, part of this work um, of these authors I just mentioned is that we use this uh, equivariant Bokshed spectral sequence to compute the equivariant homology of the C2 twisted THH of MUR, that example I mentioned earlier, with coefficients in what's called the constant Mackey functor F2. So this is an equivariant version of homology. If you're not familiar with that, I'm not gonna dive into what exactly that means, but that's the natural notion of homology to consider in this equivariant setting. Okay, I'm almost out of time, but I wanna, um, I wanna close by addressing one question. I wanna sort of bring this full circle. So at the beginning of the week, we were talking about K-theory of rings, and now I've been talking about these equivariant analogs of THH and so a question you might have is, well, can these equivariant theories tell us anything about the classical story? So can we learn about the classical story this way? And so I want to connect it back. So what does this tell us about the classical story? Well, here's one thing to say about it. Well, why would there be any connection? So here's one reason we might expect to have a connection to the classical story. The classical story was about rings. And now I've moved into this world of green functors and Mackey functors, but a ring is actually uh, a green functor. A classical ring is a green functor for the trivial group. Okay, <laughs> so um, what does that mean? Well, it means that we get some new trace maps out of this story. So I had a trace map um, from from algebraic K theory to topological Hochschild homology, we lifted through the fixed points. And if you use this new linearization map relating um, the equivariant THH to this twisted version of Hochschild homology, what you find is that you get a trace map from the algebraic K theory of a classical ring to the CP to the N twisted Hochschild homology of that ring evaluated at the orbit cp to the n mod cp to the n. So uh, I'm not going to unpack how you get that trace map exactly, but it follows directly from the, that linearization map um, that we had a moment ago. So what is this thing? Well, the way to think about this is that this is the algebraic analog of fixed points of THH. So this is a purely algebraic object that is gonna serve as an analog of fixed points of THH. Now, in order for those fixed points of THH to be useful in order to study TC, I needed to not only know about the fixed points themselves, but I needed to know about those two operators on them, that F and that R. The F map is already part of the Mackey functor. It's like built into this story automatically because it is the restriction map in those Mackey functors. So I don't have to worry about that. But the R map is something outside the Mackey functor structure. The R map, which was confusingly called the restriction um, in this context, um, that was the map that depended on the cyclotomic structure. And once you have that R map in the classical theory, um, there is an object called topological restriction homology, which is what you get when you take the limit across the R maps of THH. I didn't frame it this way on Monday, but this TR, this topological restriction homology, is like between the fixed points of THH and topological cyclic homology. It's one of the things you compute on the way. So what I'd like to know is, well, can I do this 
in the algebraic setting. Do I have an analog of that restriction map, the map that came from the cyclotomic structure? And so um, what we show in uh, Blumberg, myself, Hill, and Lawson is that you do get such uh, an analog of this restriction map. So we define geometric fixed points for Mackey functors. And we show that you get a type of cyclotomic structure on the Hochschild homology of green functors. And in particular, um, that is a, a oh, good can, question. Um, can you get this trace map via the universal property of algebraic K theory, as in Blumberg, Geffner, Tabuata? Um, I'd have to think about whether there's a way to characterize it in terms of the, uh, pr probably. <laughs> um, I'd have to think about whether there's a way to characterize it in terms of the universal properties. That's not how we define it. We define it directly through the, um, like through the trace from K theory, through the topological Dennis trace basically. Um, and the fact that the topological Dennis trace lifts through fixed points. Um, but I have not thought about whether there is a universal characterization of it. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, right, so the last thing I was saying is that we define what it, we, what it means to take geometric fixed points for Mackey functors. We prove that there's a type of cyclotomic structure on Hochschild homology for green functors. And what it gives you is it gives you an algebraic version of TR, which we call little tr. And what is this? Well, it's some limit over these algebraic versions of the restriction map of these uh, C p to the n twisted Hochschild homology for the ring A evaluated at this orbit. And as an example, you could compute, for instance, the algebraic TR of FP. So we do this calculation and uh, what goes into that? Well, you need to understand the Mackey functor norms on FP, um, the twisted cyclic bar construction on FP, and then the cyclotomic structure for that. And it turns out what you see is that you get the p-adics in degree zero and zero everywhere else. And uh, so in this case, this algebraic approximation is really a good approximation because that agrees exactly with the topological restriction homology, the topological theory, and the P completion of algebraic K theory of FP. Okay, so in this case of FP, it captures, you know, all the information basically. Um, that, of course, in general will not be true. It's some algebraic analog of this topological theory. Okay, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to stop uh, there, and it has been a pleasure to be with you this week, and I hope that I've given, um, especially the early career people, some uh, idea about what trace methods in K-theory is about, and some sort of interesting recent developments that have been happening in this area. So, I will stop there. Many thanks indeed, and let's thank uh, this uh, Tina for a wonderful mini course. Uh, there is a question. Uh, can you say roughly what the Breton uh, homology of THH uh, MUR is? And uh, does it split into pieces uh, where some of the summands are familiar? Um, yeah. Uh... I don't, I should, I should know how to <laughs> split it into pieces. Um, so I can tell you what the, uh, you know, if I, if I look it up, I can tell you what the answer is. I still remember um, when I was a PhD student many years ago now, the first time that I asked my advisor something uh, that was in a paper that he wrote and he said, um, Oh, I don't know. I'll look it up. And I, that was like, for me, a very liberating moment that even my advisor, like, didn't remember everything he'd ever written down. So, <laughs> so I don't feel bad about looking up this answer in my own paper. Um, right. So what is the answer for the, the, the C2 equivariant homology of the topological Hochschild homology of MUR? So this is the C2 twisted Hochschild homology. So in this case, we get a really nice answer. Um, so I haven't, 
Okay, there were a few things I didn't say. So one of the things I didn't say is that that equivariant Bokshted spectral sequence, when you start working in these equivariant worlds, you end up having multiple gradings. You get a Z graded spectral sequence. So a spectral se you get Z graded theories where they're graded by the integers like we're used to. And you also get theories graded by representation rings. And so it turns out that the representation ring object is the more natural thing to consider in many cases. So what I'm writing down is the ROC2 graded equivariant homology. Um, and for those of you who are not, not who are new to equivariant stable homotopy theory, let me introduce you to a really special convention, which is that a five-pointed star is uh, usually an equivariant grading. That means a representation and an asterisk is an integer grading. So um, something useful to know. So that grading is now graded by representations. And what this is, is it's the eilenberg maclean the equivariant homotopy groups of the eilenberg maclean spectrum of F2 uh, with polynomial generators on that. And then it's box over HF2 star of the exterior thing um, over HF2 star of Z1, Z2, et cetera. So I don't know if that was helpful or not. The degree of BI is I times the representation, the regular representation and the degree of ZI is one plus that. So that's what the answer is for the equivariant homology of that. And I don't know if you find that helpful or not. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, Right, okay, so one way of seeing, so the question is, one way of seeing topological Hochschild homology is as a relative smash product over A uh, tensor A op, and is there an analog of this for this CN twisted THH? Um, yes, you can think of the uh, CN twisted THH in terms of these uh, relative smash products. Um, maybe the thing to say is that, so if I'm interested in, let's say, the H twisted THH of R, and I'm interested in that as like a G spectrum. So if I'm, I think I did that in the opposite direction I meant to. If I want to look at the G spectrum, um, restrict that to a G spectrum, then you can write this as, uh, it's the norm from H to G of R smash over that thing uh, op. So the, uh, no, sorry, that the enveloping thing, the that smash that op. But then what you have over here is you have a twisted version in, of the norm. So yes, there is a way to characterize it in terms of these relative smash products, but you pick up a little bit of a twist. So it's a bit different than the classical story. Um, the next question I see is, is there a trace map from the equivariant K theory to this twisted THH? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that's and a very natural question to ask is like, well, I've talked about, you know, uh, I, at the end I was saying, well, you can get trace maps out of a ring, but can we naturally get trace maps from some kind of equivariant version of K-theory to this twisted THH? Um, the answer to that is yes. I have work in progress with um, some of the people that I mentioned, Catherine Adamic, Catherine Hess, Inbar Klang, and Hannah Giacong, where we're looking at like, what is the right kind of K-theory in order to get that sort of trace map? And um, maybe I won't say, too much about that since it's work in progress. Uh, I don't want to make any bold claims yet. Um, but we have constructed, uh, we're working on a trace map um, relating that. I don't know how it relates to like known notions of equivariant K-theory. So a lot of people have considered different notions of equivariant algebraic K-theory. And I, I don't yet have like a connection between um, the CN relative THH and those different known theories of equivariant K-theory. Um, is there a reason we don't have to use a derived limit for TR? Um, I mean, so this limit that I'm talking about here, these things that I uh, am taking the limit of now are all just um, abelian groups. And so here it, it is just like an ordinary limit of abelian groups that ends up being the right thing to take there. I don't know, maybe that's not a very satisfying answer, um, but that's what's happening in this case. Um, let me read Yuri's question. If G is a finite group acting on a commutative ring R, can we cook up a G Timbara functor, um, perhaps with the fixed point? G is a finite group acting on a commutative ring R. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. So um, do you want like a group acting on a classical ring? Can we cook up a G to bar functor? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer to your question is. I apologize. Um, what kind of marine invariance properties does twisted THH have? That's another great question. <laughs> um, so the, Right, so these Hawk shield theories in general, Hawk shield homology, topological Hawk shield homology, any sort of Hawk shield theory, one thing that you might wanna ask for is that it's Merida invariant, right? That's something that's really common amongst Hawk shield theories and something that's sort of important to those theories. Um, in many cases, you can prove that directly, but there's a recent work of, uh, coming out of work of Kate Ponto and Ponto Shulman, and now there's a larger group of collaborators, uh, Ponto, Campbell and Ponto, et cetera. Um, where they've talked about Hochschild homology and topological Hochschild homology as bicategorical shadows. And that shadow approach, um, whatever that means, I don't want to go into what that means, but but it's uh, we heard a little bit about it in the first lecture this morning, if you were there, that kind of idea of a shadow. If you know that uh, THH is a shadow, then Merida invariance comes for free, because it turns out Merida invariance is like a natural notion of equivalence on bicategories. So um, the question is about twisted THH, and this is a great question. Um, in that same work in progress that I mentioned of Adamic and myself and Hess and Klang and Kong, um, we've shown that you can view this twisted topological Hochschild homology as sort of an equivariant shadow. And so in particular, you get Merida invariance also in this case for free. And so, yeah, it aligns nicely with what you'd expect from one of these topological Hochschild or Hochschild theories, and, and you do get Merida invariance. So that's uh, a nice property to know that you have of twisted THH. Any other questions or comments to Tina? If not, then merci beaucoup for everything <laughs> for a wonderful uh, mini course. And thank let's you. thank uh, Tina again. Thank you.